Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Bash Mania podcast. Thank you for tuning in. This is episode 175, and I'm thrilled to have Zane Rutherford back on the show today. We were talking yesterday about the World Cup and why he wasn't going. I said, you know what? Let's have this conversation on the podcast. So we did just that. Before we dive into today's show, this podcast is brought to you by our friends at Attack, A-T-A-C. If you listen to this podcast, you know I love the folks at Attack. You know I love the Attack app. Attack is an app for athletes. It's an AI strength and conditioning coach, a nutritionist, a mentality mentor, all in one, all in one app, all in your pocket. You can set your age, your goals, have your program. You can get workouts. You can get recipes. You can get meal plans, everything you need. You can learn from Jordan Burroughs and Trent Hidley and Reese Humphrey, Nate Jackson, Sarah Hildebrandt, so many others. Guys, it is a it was an app for wrestlers built by wrestlers to help you wrestle better. If you care about leveling up, if you want to be in better shape, if you want to wrestle better, download the Attack app today. It is A-T-A-C. Attack is in the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store today. Zane Rutherford, it has been a minute since you're on here. How are you, man? Doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. We were talking yesterday about the World Cup and stuff, and I said, you know what? It's been too long. Let's, uh, let's hop on the podcast. Have a lot of the conversation we were having is all stuff that we can talk about on the podcast so many times. I feel like athletes, there's a lot that goes unsaid, but a lot of what you were telling me specifically talking about scheduling world cup and stuff was like, it's public stuff. It's just a lot of times the athletes aren't really asked the questions, you know, like why aren't you competing or when are you competing every now and then you are, but that's if timelines line up like right now, you know, we're doing this because of the world cup, but as a whole, you know, we were talking about athletes and, and sharing more. So thought this was a good time to hop on, have a discussion about World Cup, World Championships, some other stuff. I guess before we talk World Cup, it was an interesting year for you. Let's let's start with World Championships. And I don't want to you were on the Bader show um, and you went through your semifinal match and you went through a bunch. So if you want to hear it even more detail on that go listen to when Zane was in the Bader show a couple months ago, but I will kind of, you know, scratch the f- surface with some stuff. You went 26 and zero points wise through the first four matches. It's like you won your matches 10, 0, 5, 0, 4, 0, 7, 0. I'm not a brainiac. I literally just looked it up. So just so you okay. know, <laughs> I can't remember all that stuff that well, but so you went, you outscored your opponents 26 and zero, and then Nora Cooney just the match kind of went sideways quick. As as a fan watching, it seemed like it was off to a good start. Like you got it on the shot, and I'm like, yes, Zane's a world champ. I'm already like celebrating at the end. And then all of a sudden, the match went sideways pretty quick. What was your takeaway after that match? Uh, bittersweet. Yeah, I just talked to Coach Cody after the match. I I kind of looked at him like right after it happened, like crap, like like not much you can say really. Just got caught in a lace and. Yeah. Uh, like normally, you know, you get taken down or whatever. Even you get thrown to your back, get off your back. Like there's still a match to be had, but uh, it's just one of those cases where it's like, yep, that's it. That's all it is. Uh, but Coach Cody just like, you know, second sucks because it's like you had a great tournament, and yep. uh, you still have a lot to be proud of. Like you medaled for the first time in all your trips there, and I think you wrestled great all tournament. Like like you said, 26 and 0. I felt felt like things were rolling pretty good. And he's like, you still can't really hang your head, even though I know you I know you wanted uh, a belt. You wanted yeah. first place. So, yeah, that's kind of the thought. It's just bittersweet. I think that technically uh, I, I just started watching it again. And I, like, watched how he got into the lace because I felt like me fighting that actually tightened it up for him. Yeah. And uh, so that was kind of – it was different than I've felt before. And uh, Coach Cunningham had just said – uh, I guess Carter Sirachi got hit in like the same lace at his U23s. He's like, it's just funny how things make a comeback. Like I haven't seen that technique in over like 20 years or whatever. Uh, and now I'm seeing it again. It's coming back and uh, just a different kind of lace. And we're just working on how to defend it and also like how to apply it. It's a, it's a pretty nice turn, honestly. And uh, kudos to him for figuring that out. And I want to apply that to my own wrestling if I can, because it's pretty solid lace. 
Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, knowing that your path to another gold medal likely goes through him. He he is a superstar. How much of, of your preparation next time around will be specifically for him? Or is it really just on the individual things you mentioned? Like if it's defending a leg lace, if it's one specific technique, like what's that balance like of preparing individually for someone versus knowing, like, especially like you said, he got the leg lace and it was kind of over. Like you have that one thing to hang on to, to prepare for next time. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how true this is or not, but we were sitting at, uh, the the medalist at my weight class, we were all sitting, getting ready to get on the award stand. And I was just, we were kind of talking. I was talking with the Japanese opponent and he was saying that this is his last uh, freestyle tournament. He's going to go Greco. Really? And for the next, yeah, for the next, for the Olympic team, that's his goal. So he's going Greco wow. for the next world championship. So I don't know if that's true. You never know. Uh, a lot can happen. But yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm definitely aware of it next time. And even aside from him, it's a place I don't want to get caught again. Uh, sometimes you see things work at one world championships and people will from other countries will try to implement that going throughout the year. So who knows? Someone else can be working on that lace also. Just want to be able to defend it going forward. Yeah. And it's interesting. I had a talk with Gilman on here um, a while back about silver versus bronze medal. And, and it's funny, you know, it is bittersweet. Like, so bronze medal, you're you're obviously fighting back, and when you win, you become a medalist. Silver is so different because you've already medaled, and you kind of look past it, and if you lose the last match and you get the silver, the perspective seems to be more on the silver and the loss than the actual process of winning that medal. How much did it, did it take, like, time? Like I, you, you put out a great post on Instagram you know, about how grateful for you are for the progress and your worth not being tied just to to the competition and to the results. What was that process like reflecting to get to that state of, of gratitude for it and appreciating the silver medal? Yeah, I think I was just putting too much on myself uh, to go out and perform. Um, and it is a big stage, but at the end of the day, it's a sport. And so I think that this past year, I've just kind of approached it in that manner. And Kind of sounds weird to say, but I wasn't too disappointed, I guess, after this. Yeah. After I, after I medaled, even after I lost, it's like, yeah, obviously I wanted to win. You know, you put a lot of work into this and to end out on top is always the goal. But really, I didn't really feel too deflated where in years past I would be deflated for a while. And uh, yeah. that would have been been less. Uh, yeah. More detrimental. So, yeah, I think uh, that was it was a positive thing. It allows me to approaching the sport that way allows me to move forward a lot faster than just hanging on to like, Oh man, I lost that last match. What if all the what ifs. So it's definitely healthier. And not only that, it allows me to wrestle better. I believe. What was the process? Like if there's young wrestlers listening to this, I always try to give as much value and entertainment to listeners because surely nobody's tuning in to hear me talk. They want to learn from you. They want to be entertained from you. You know, it's funny as I'm, kind of looking over your career and trying to pull out different things, you know, in college, you lost in the big 10 championships in 2014, but then 2016, 2017, 2018, three straight undefeated season gold um, at big tens at NCAAs. You didn't have those losses. Like you have early in your freestyle career where I feel like sometimes it takes loss to say, okay, this is what this feels like. Let me find the gratitude in this. What was that process like when you got to the freestyle scene and the kind of ebbs and flows of your career was much different in the last, you know, three years of college, you've had such a different um, up and down freestyle. What has it been like getting to that place of having the gratitude and kind of not beating yourself up too much? Yeah, I get, there's a lot to that. I think just, I had to adjust like technically I had to adjust from folk style, which is mostly control. You know, I control the position, whether it's a takedown, I have to control it. There's no reaction time, but I at least got to control for a second or, uh, you know, even getting turns. There's a lot more time on top folk style and you got to control your opponent on your back, get that count versus just everything in freestyle is a little bit different with the exposure. You know, I, I could be finishing a leg attack. I think is solid in folk style, but in freestyle, I'm getting rolled through. And that happened a lot to me 
uh, in my freestyle career initially, just, you know, I would force the leg attack, force exposure, get rolled through. Now it's two and two. A lot of times lose a match by a point against a guy that's a medalist. And you just can't make those mistakes. And I think I've addressed a lot of those technical areas and, you know, just have been approaching the sport from a better mindset also, not not putting too much on myself, uh, you know, when I do make a mistake like that, just scoring one point at a time and uh, allowing the points to come as they come. And what's the process like over time where it's being able to be okay with that process of learning and growing instead of just saying like, okay, I didn't win. I'm upset. Obviously everybody's upset when they lose, but you're finding things to work on. You're tweaking it and you're having a mature mentality that you kind of had to develop post college because you didn't have that process really in college. Yeah, I guess I, I did my freshman year just uh, a lot. I took fifth my freshman year of college, and those are, I guess, the main growing pains. I did have some matches in college that were closer at times, like had a two-to-one match against B.J. Claygon, had an overtime match with Sorensen that could have lost easily. Uh, but, yeah, I think in freestyle, just, just being patient with myself, not too patient, where – just making the same same mistakes over and over and over again, but learning not to get frustrated easily. I think that that helped a lot. When you get when you're operating out of a place, a mindset of frustration, then your wrestling can't your life. You just can't live it right, and uh, you can't make clear clear decisions. So just clear my mind, get into a state of you know I'm at peace when I'm wrestling now. It's uh, I'm not operating out of a spot of frustration, and so that helps a lot. And it's hard to do, like you said, it's hard to do when uh, things aren't going your way, say points aren't going your way. It's hard to, that, that's when it tests you the most, uh, Not choosing not to be frustrated and choosing to, okay, what, what's the next th- best thing I can do is just score points, win the next score. So, Yeah, and it's interesting because in wrestling, there's all this downtime where you have a tournament and then, you know, regardless of how you do, you have months typically before your next competition. And if you, from what I've heard from you and others, that like if you do dwell on it too long, it only hurts you. It only hurts your training. And especially after you've had a lot of success, it's very easy to have that high expectation for yourself every single time. How did you come to the conclusion in the realization that our worth is not tied up in victories or gold medals or whatever it may be? Yeah, I think it all kind of came to a head uh, at the Olympic trials 2021. Just like I felt like I was a second behind all my reactions. And so I just and just wasn't competing with fire and like excitement. It was more like uh, just fear, I guess. And it's not how I wanted to compete. It was kind of it was crippling, honestly. So I just didn't want to feel that way towards wrestling. And I'm just I really had to just say, you know what, I'm not. No matter what I change, uh, I, I don't want to feel that way again. So that's kind of I'm, I'm grateful for the Olympic trials because it forced me to change my wrestling. And I feel a lot better aside from, you know, finally meddling this year, just feel better. And I'm enjoying it. And, you know, I started hitting moves this year that I that I did well in in uh, folk style. Even just uh, I got a move. I got a Turk, a pin at the World Championships against uh, the Swiss opponent. Just having fun with the sport, really. Yeah. And, you know, it's also so different because in in college you have classes and stuff, but you're pretty much a singular focus on winning NCAAs. That's that's what it is. Now, as a senior level athlete, you're married. You have baby Zane on the way in January. You've got a, you know, your house to maintain. You have brand deals. You have a partnership with Rudis. Like navigating being a senior level athlete, especially in wrestling, is very different than being a college athlete. And I got to assume that at this point, it's kind of like being a CEO of your own personal brand. Like the Zane Rutherford brand on all faucets is something that you have to make decisions for regularly. And as we kind of segue into the World Cup in a second, what has that been like managing that aspect of your career in life? Yeah, uh, that was another positive change that I feel like I made this past year is, like you said, it's kind of all wrestling focused now. Like in college, we had school and other commitments to focus on. And I actually, I talked to Coach Kale after 
the Olympic trials and I mentioned that I wanted to go back to school. So I've been doing that recently. I've been doing it online through Penn State, trying to get my MBA uh, through Penn State. So that actually has allowed me to separate. Do you have any eligibility left? uh, There is talk (laughs) about a COVID year. I don't know. (laughs) It'd be nice to get an NIL deal right about now. That'd be sweet. I wouldn't mind that. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah, that's uh it it's hard when it when your whole life is just wrestling. Uh I think just having a little bit, having something else. I like that like some of the other wrestlers also are they're married, they have kids as well. It's just yeah. it uh, allows you to get step away for a second and just have a perspective of something bigger. So I think that's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, so let we'll talk World Cup for a few minutes. You know, the World Cup rosters came out yesterday and I kind of teased out what it sounds like based on everybody I'm talking to, what they're going to be. And USA Wrestling confirms that what I said was right. And they had added like the alternates at each way. But pretty much those are the guys wrestling. And one of the big reactions was so many of our world medalists not going. And as a fan, I definitely understand the perspective of like, we want, we're selfish. We want to see the stars as much as possible. We want to see you, Taylor, Dake, all these guys. And on the women's side, too, I think Hildebrand's not going, uh, Mensa Stock's not going, you know, um, somebody else, too. But they're, they're not, they're not hearing the other side. And that was what I called you about yesterday. I'm like, so why aren't you going, not in a negative sense, but just trying to understand the athlete side of it. Um, so what was your decision not to go to the World Cup? Yeah, most of it, simplified version, it comes down to timing. I think yeah. the timing of December doesn't make a lot of sense, especially with, if you look at our year, right? So the freestyle circuit, we get started, say you're in Final X, uh, you wrestle in June, and then it's, maybe another competition this summer summer is pretty much all go through mid late september and then then that's your downtime so i was just okay. looking at like what's down the pipeline and ideally i'd like to get a tournament or two at this maybe like february march uh april somewhere in there so that i can get a competition feel good going into final x because yeah. the whole goal is to make another world team you know win a world championship that's pretty much the highest goal at this level right now. So that's what it boils down to is timing. And I felt like now was good timing to take some time off, focus on, you know, I feel healthy, but just focus on healing all the way. You don't know if you have something, you know, underlying and you just want to, just want to feel good going into this stretch that we got this summer and uh, fall next fall. So that's mostly what it comes down to. And what really goes into making those decisions? You know, on one side, it's it's got to be interesting being like the coaches because it's like the NWC, you got some guys going, you know, Nolf and Snyder competing, you, Gilman, um, Taylor, Dake, not competing. So it's not like it's a blanket coach, which I think sometimes some people think that it's just like, oh, the Hawkeye Wrestling Club isn't sending their athletes or the NWC isn't sending their athletes. It's a very individualized decision. For you, what was that like? Is it talking to other athletes? Is it talking to coaches? Like, what's that process like of determining, you know, whether or not to go to something like the World Cup? Yeah, you know, I'm very lucky at with the Midland Wrestling Club. We got a lot of the world team at Penn State. So I do obviously collaborate with some of the guys, see what they're doing, see what the consensus is, but also kind of being my own decision. I met with coach Cody and they're never pushy one way or another. They will offer their opinion, but they don't really, they, they do whatever the athlete wants to do, especially at, you know, at, at our level. So, um, yeah, I just told coach Cody that I was thinking that now was a good time to take some time off, focus on technique, recover, get ready for our baby that's coming here. And, you know, a couple months. So that's kind of where my head was at and he respected it and kind of just said, all right, this sounds good. So, but yeah, that's, that's about that. How much do you view wrestling? It's funny. Cause I was thinking about this as I was preparing for the show, we, we get excited for USA competing as a whole fans love it. The athletes love it at the same point, you know, when Carly Lloyd became a client of mine, she was really, this was years ago. And she was kind of telling me how 
the teammates are also competitors. In her sense, you're competing for maybe the best brand deal or you're competing for playing time, whatever it might be. In wrestling, it's very similar. You got, you know, at 65, 70, 74, you got Yanni, you, Dake, all meddling. And while your teammates, you're also competitors, especially in a situation like you're in where you're going to have to go down to 65 and wrestle your 2022 world team teammate or go up and wrestle you know potentially your nlwc and world team teammate and date what is that balance like for you of camaraderie with the team with the world team with the usa team and that competitiveness knowing that those guys that you're in fellowship with could also be a roadblock in the future yeah i don't i don't try to think about it day to day i just yeah. think that wrestling with those guys or really any chance I can, you know, picking their brains is a positive thing and it just lifts everybody up. So that's kind of how I view it. You know, I, I wrestled Nick Lee at the Olympic trials 2021 uh, and Nick Lee was my training partner this whole year, you know, helping me get yeah. ready for, for worlds. And uh, so that, that's a good example. And I, I don't really think about it. I just, again, we just lift each other up and help each other get better and help each other in those moments when we're training for big events like this. So yeah, I guess I could see so, how some people have to separate the two, but I just see how we're we, – we are all competitors, but, yeah, we lift each other up. So I think I see it as a good thing. Yeah, no, I think it's a good thing too. I think it's, again, I think it's one of those things that fans, myself included, speculate on because if you're not hearing it or if you're not seeing it, like I've talked to so many of you guys and, and you guys have a very mature perspective on it, but from the outside in, it's like – you there was not too much chatter on it, but like with date coming to the NLWC, you know, NLWC is so good. It's building such a um, rapport of wrestlers. It's kind of like the Dagestan of the U S where you could have, you know, NLWC versus NLWC for an Olympic team for a world team. And I think, like you said, a lot of it too, is not thinking too far in advance. Like I know people are already asking you if you think you're going up or down, for the Olympics, you know, and I know you said that you don't know yet, but it, it is an interesting angle of, of seeing how this happens. I think you do have to have a mature perspective to not kind of demonize your teammates, but that can't be easy. And obviously I'm not in that position either way. Yeah, I think too, you can't take it personally, like especially the Olympic year, it's six weight classes for the entire United States. So six wrestlers get to represent you know, the United States, hopefully at the Olympic Games. And we got about, I don't know how many people we have at the Nittany Line Wrestling Club, a dozen, you know, male athletes. So, you know, and, and only six spots. So can't take it personally. It's going to happen. And you're probably going to be wrestling somebody. You know, the, the field gets smaller, the higher level of competition. You know, some of the people that you see growing up are no longer wrestling at the senior level. And so, yeah, the field gets small and it's likely you're going to wrestle somebody that, might be a friend or a teammate or whatnot. And you can't really take it personally. Yeah. Well, we already saw it in 2021 with David Taylor and Bo nickel winner gets right. the 86 kilo Olympic team spot. And it's going to be interesting because the 2024 Olympic team trials are in state college. It's going to be very crazy to see if there is a Penn state versus Penn state or NLWC versus NLWC guy in state college, what the fans do, what the we're, we're a long ways away from that, but it is something that definitely pops in my mind um, now and then at the same side of that too. NLWC is not only growing so much, but Penn state on the college side, you know, Facundo and Shane Van Ness looked incredible in their rec hall debuts. I think Facundo scored like 23 points and Van Ness like 16 before he got the pin. How much are you working with these college guys and able to kind of, I know when Gilman was on, he was talking about how much he loves kind of both sides of it, like working with someone like Roman and learning from him. Also, like you're the big brother now, like you're 27 years old. We joke about COVID eligibility and I would love to see that, but like, you're like, you're one of the older guys in the room now. What's that been like? Yeah, I, I think it's a pretty unique thing. Like we we're not coaches by any means, but we get to work with the kids and uh, they get to help us also get better you know, at, at what we're doing and, and prepare for what we're doing. So it's pretty cool. And 
I think it's taught me that it, it's taught me how to explain technique better. Every time I go with some, one of, you know, the younger college kids, it's taught me to explain technique and better understand it for myself. And it's also taught me like, I just wrestled Carter Storacci the other day and he's bigger than me and younger than me. And he's, he's still in college, but I could still learn from him. Like he was telling me something for my wrestling that I could apply that, that he does that he thinks I could use. I yeah. think that's really, really valuable. And I'm not, I'm not uh, going to be like, okay, you're younger than me. Uh, I, I can't learn from you kind of thing. Like, yeah. uh, so I, I think it's cool. It's unique. And yeah, I'm just taking it either way, whether I'm showing them technique or like a guy like Carter showing me technique, there's always something to, to be learned. How much do you follow college wrestling as a whole right now? Um, a good bit. You know, I, yeah, I go to all the matches. I follow, I like to know where our, our guys stack up against the competition. So yeah, good bit. I'm always curious, like once somebody graduates, how much they stay. Cause like when you're in it, when you're in it for so long and then you're out, there's an, obviously an aspect like the alumni and being there, but then it's also one of those things where it's like, feeling out of the loop i know some guys once they graduate they feel so out of the loop that it's they focus a bit more on the on the senior level but there's a lot to be uh excited about and proud about in penn state watching that speaking of penn state david taylor was on ariel hawani's show was pretty good um i was surprised to hear him say that on a scale of one to ten his likeliness to compete in mma was now a four when in the past it was <laughs> one have you given any thought to any kind of future in MMA? Uh, I have in the past, but so Bo Nichols always in my ear to try to get me to <laughs> Shocker. do it. Yeah, <laughs> but I I don't think so. I, I, I really enjoy wrestling. I think it's, you know, it's one of the martial arts and there's still so much to be learned in wrestling. It's just one of them. So, yeah, I don't think I don't think I would do it. I also... I have an interest to go into business someday or, you know, do something else that on that side, try to try to use my brain and try not to get it knocked around. That'd be the, the goal with that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I don't, I've gotten hit in the head too many times in wrestling. I don't think I need to get knocked out or anything like that. So it's kind of my, yeah. And idea. I had a, I mean, a good indicator of that is going to get your MBA. <laughs> that kind of yeah. says that post wrestling, you're, you're looking more to go on the business side than the octagon. Um, you mentioned so no World Cup. You're mentioning to to look to get some competitions in February. I'm also curious because the UWW year end rankings just came out, and I put out that some of our guys got paid. And for those who maybe didn't get the full memo, the way it works is if you go to ranking series events you get points throughout the year, including points, the world championships and Gilman, Snyder, David, Jordan, and Kyle all got year and bonuses. And people were like flipping out because David Taylor only got 2000 despite winning worlds. Date got 3000. So I am curious when, when you start having these ranking series events and whether it's, you know, the top prize is five grand. Um, there's obviously, seeding implications for worlds does ranking series come into play at all i know there's not a ranking series to like i don't think february but yeah i i don't think about it too much just because i'm not sure how many points david taylor had in 2018 how many ranking series points he had but regardless he ended up with yazdani first round at the world championships so it's just like anything can happen and you know even if you're the number one seed going into the world championships, something like that could, could happen just as likely. So yeah, I don't put too much weight into it. If, if the ranking series makes sense with my training plans, then I will try to go to, to them for sure. I think they're it's usually where a lot of the top competition goes. So it's always a good place to test yourself, but yeah, I don't worry about it too much for seeding or for the bonus. Really. I think it was like five grand, which is nice, but yeah, uh, yeah it's not worth like, like for me this year, I think I could have, I probably could have, I think I was number four, so I just missed it, but I think I could have cracked into the top three if I had wrestled at the Pan Am, at the Pan Ams in Mexico, but my body just wasn't where I wanted it to be for the world team trials at the time, so I didn't end up wrestling, and uh, I think that's, I mean, that was obviously the right move with how the rest of the year played out. 
Yeah. How much is it for you, your perspective on what you share versus what you don't? You know, a lot of athletes, I got me, Don, Willie, we had a show last week on Willie's show where we were talking about, you know, the secrets in wrestling versus the transparency in wrestling. And I'm curious your perspective about not oversharing, but trying to get the sport to a point to where there is more communication you know, one of the reasons I share so much stuff out about who is competing this and that is to try to build the hype. If you know somebody's competing, it it, it helps tell the storylines. It builds excitement, and it's not necessarily on you to increase fandom, especially of wrestling as a whole. But I do feel like as our wrestlers share more, and I'm not just talking about like when you feel good, when you don't injuries with that, just in general, like what your perspective is on, on kind of what you share and what you don't and, and the sport as a whole doing that. Yeah. I was just watching like the NFL the other day. And I was thinking that like the fans in sports like that are so involved with injuries, right. And they have yeah. injury reports. And I, I think that is good for those sports. Like there's, there's fantasy leagues for sports like football for that reason. And it creates more fan engagement. And I think I do agree with you that I think wrestling is lacking that element. It's a lot more private of a sport. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I agree with you. And I think that for me, I, I don't know. I don't really have anything to, to hide with stuff like that. You know, if it, uh, I, I would share, I think sometimes like I didn't, didn't compete at the Pan Ams. Just wasn't, like I said, my body wasn't ready health wise. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to reveal that that kind of information when I'm competing uh, two or three weeks later at like the sure. world championships. So just protecting that, trying to protect myself, give myself the best chance I can to, yeah, to make a spot, to make a world team, to, to win a medal. And yeah, I, I guess that's where my head goes in those instances. But also if someone were to ask, I I wouldn't be promoting it online. Like, Hey, this is what's going on. But yeah, if someone, someone were to ask me straight up, I would tell them, you know, it's also too like, cause I totally get both sides and it is, it, it is not easy to create the content, let alone for stuff. That's not just natural. Like I saw you did um, a couple of weeks ago, like top five post way in foods, which was yeah. hilarious. Stuff like that is fun to do now and then. But you see how hard it is to come up with content and create content on the regular. And even if you do want to share, it's one reason I, I created this podcast is to try to keep having guys on to tell your story, to share things, to give you that platform. But it, it is definitely like I will say that having worked with so many athletes, you are so laser focused. And like you said, you're preparing to have a baby. You just got married. There is so much going on. You don't always have all the time to sit here and create content and plan stuff out what to share and what not to share. And I do think that is kind of a reminder. That's very important who you partner up with. You know, I take a lot of pride in my circle and like, I think your website and Yanni's website was updated within like an hour of you guys meddling at the world championships and not to toot my own horn, but like it is important to have people around you that can help you because it gets very hard to do everything yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, especially I, I don't enjoy that's not my first talent, I guess, is like creating content or yeah, updating. I, I appreciate you updating the website like you did. It, it's it's awesome. Um, I, it's not my first inclination. And so any partnering up with people that can that help you in those areas, especially if you're not inclined that way, helps a lot. Yeah. And also, too, it depends on my thing with athletes is always how much are you asking of your fans? Like the more you're asking of them, the more you should give. If you're constantly pushing merch and camps and everything else, like you should engage with your fans more because you want them to feel a better relationship with you so that you can have kind of that two way street where I'm sure if, if I gave you five minutes to think about wrestlers who just ask and who only use social media to you know buy my shirt sign up for my camp like yes you can do that stuff if you're doing it so much you should consider the other side of trying to give out as much content and value all that um well, that's a whole nother conversation for another day zane thank you for coming on any final words before i let you go no have a good thanksgiving and yeah i'm looking forward to thanksgiving also so i'm super excited for, for thanksgiving we did a Chenzo, Nolf, and I did a Thanksgiving Day snake draft. 
last year was very, very fun. I got to figure out, maybe we'll try to schedule one for this year too. It was very fun. Like top five, like activities, foods, everything. Very, very fun episode. I love Thanksgiving. I do think Christmas season starts now and Thanksgiving (laughs) is a part of that season. And I know it's a very contentious debate. Where do you stand on that? Yeah, my wife wants to start putting up the tree, so I'm trying to put that to a halt. I'm kind of like, <laughs> let's get let's get past Thanksgiving first. But she does have a point because it did finally just snow. So last week it was in the 70s, and I was like, it does not feel like Christmas. But now we're we're starting to get there. So look at you get you go through all this hassle of decorating, putting up lights. Enjoy it for as long as possible. When those clocks go back and it's dark at 4:30, I want the Christmas lights up. I want them up. I want to enjoy them through the darkness. So I am team start decorating now. We have one of our Christmas trees in the living room is already up. We haven't fully decorated, but we do have a tree up. But I do love Thanksgiving. It's one of the best days of the year. Can't wait to host everybody. So, all right, guys, go follow Zane. Uh, He's going to be sharing for sure when he's competing after this conversation. So go follow Zane, and uh, we'll catch you soon. Later, man. And the beat goes on.